everyone. How's it going? Um, I guess I'm here to talk about computer music, but also kind of a story that I've, maybe a little journey so far that I've been on. And uh, it's kind of centered around this place. This is the Knoll at Stanford University. It's also the place where I work. It's the Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics. That's abbreviated CCRMA, and it's pronounced Karma. And this is really kind of a nexus of music, computer science, electrical engineering, cognition, signal processing, and a lot of other things kind of under one roof and working together. But before I got to Stanford, I was a uh, graduate student at Princeton. That's, that's not me. But that is the computer we see in this picture is the IBM 360 is actually one of the machines actually used to synthesize sound. And of course, computers are really attractive for audio because of their precision, because if you can actually write the algorithm to generate a particular waveform, then you have that sound. And in theory, we can actually generate any sound that we're capable of hearing. Uh, in practicality, you know, 99% of the sound that we might generate might be kind of irritating or dangerous. Um, but we do want to find the sound that sounds good. So one of the things I worked on is actually a programming language by the name of Chuck. And Chuck is a programming language for sound. And the idea is that it's really, I'll give you a quick demo here. And um, the idea with Chuck is that it's, you know, if you program, then you've heard of strong typing. Well, Chuck is a strongly timed language and has um, facilities for dealing with time and concurrency. But I'm going to do here's another aspect of Chuck, which I call on the fly programming. This idea is to really abuse the speed of computers to write code um, as, we, as we go. So I'm actually going to be swapping out programs in and out. So what I have here is just a simple patch. Up here is a sine oscillator. Here's a set of pitch classes. I'm going to randomly draw from the pitch class and then uh, set the frequency of the sine wave to that and then do so every 200 milliseconds, just to note it down here. And then so let me go ahead and play that. Right now it's just one pitch in my pitch class. I'm going to add a major second to that. Uh, let's boost that up by a couple of octaves so it can be in you know, several registers. So every time you see this equal sign, I'm actually ripping out the code that's in the virtual machine and cramming in a new one. So let's keep going. Let's add a, whoops, let's add a major third, a perfect fifth. And let's make it a little faster. Um, add a little reverb. Connect that into the chain. Mix. And make it go a little higher yet. Sixth, major seven, a little faster yet. Drop the sixth, and so on and so forth. And the idea is that you can actually experiment with sound and musical passages in ways that are very real time, and the feedback loop is almost immediate. And this is actually a way of working onto itself. And that's one of the things that Chuck allows us to do. Um, And then Chuck was actually used in the Princeton Laptop Orchestra, or Plork. Um, this is founded by professors Dan Truman and my advisor Perry Cook at Princeton, and I was very fortunate to be part of this. Um, this uses Chuck as a primary software platform. What we do here is actually build instruments, but we pair people with computers with a, a, a hemispherical speaker array designed to radiate sound from near the performer. And so if we go back to this picture, after I came to Stanford, uh, I started my own laptop orchestra, the Stanford Laptop Orchestra, or SLORC. By the way, uh, you, if anyone's keeping track, you try to keep track of the number of five-letter acronyms that I will have in my talk. We have Karma, Chuck, SLORC, PLORC so far. We'll have more. These things leading up the steps are actually what we made the speaker raise to Stanford with. Um, this is actually outside the knoll. And you saw a picture of this. These are the speaker arrays we use in Stanford, and we, I'll show you how we made them real quick. It uh, starts actually with this. This is an IKEA salad bowl. It's an 11 inch Blanda mat. Uh, most important steps, perhaps, turning it upside down. And then you drill a lot of holes in them. By the way, we made 20 of these. And then you route the bottom. And then in these holes, you plug in speaker drivers. These are just pretty much standard car audio speakers. And then we rip apart these compact um, amplifiers, stack them so that there's actually six channels, P put them inside the base plate, and actually do this like 20 times over. Fortunately, we had a lot of people working on this. And then to each station, you add a laptop, you add a audio interface, you add pillows and mats for people to sit on. 
And, and also, here's an IKEA breakfast tray table. Like a third of the ensemble's hardware really comes from IKEA. Um, here's power, you can chain that together, wireless, sometimes we network our software, power conditioner. Uh, we add musical interfaces as well as um, gaming interfaces, and we use these all in the service of expressive musical control and performance. And when you add all that together, you have one of these guys, and you multiply that by 20, you have one of these. And that is the Laptop Orchestra. This is the Stanford Laptop Orchestra on stage with the Stanford New Ensemble, traditional acoustic instruments, and performing via the internet with musicians in Beijing. This happened in the spring of 2008. Um, and in addition to um, the ensemble being a performance platform, it's also a teaching platform. It's a classroom that we have that naturally integrates um, coding, programming, sound synthesis, composition, and live performance in a kind of this um, very, I think, very naturally integrated situation. And the assignments range from, you know, make a drum machine to make a trio performance or make a performance for the whole ensemble. And people just have to learn programming and sound and signal processing and composition along the way. And it's almost as if we're just all learning by accident. And for me, that's a really powerful way of actually learning. And so I'll give you a quick demo using actually the joystick here, if I can go to the overhead. And so this is your standard joystick. Um, I think I got it for $18 at CompUSA some years ago. Um, I'm going to run a Chuck program here, and what's going to do, what you're hearing is a synthesized scene model. That's not going to fool anyone. You're going to say, hey, that's not a human. That's a, that's a computer. But what happens when we add some expressive control to it? So what I'm going to do here is that every time I squeeze the trigger, it sings. It doesn't get tired. Um, as I move in this 2D plane, it changes the vowel that is singing. Twisting it gives a vibrato. This controls volume. You can also, because it's a model, break it apart. Instead of making it sing, you can make it breathe. And then you combine it with the keyboard. And these are all just commodity items. There, I just press the keys Z, C, B, A, D, G, W, E. And that's just, this is kind of mapped out like a fretboard on a, on a guitar. And you can sing really high or low. Or high. for example. Um, thank you. Um, back to the slides, please. And uh, so that was the laptop orchestra, and that was Chuck. So um, what that kind of led into is then this next area of adventure. And uh, so here's a rather interesting question. I think it's somewhat rhetorical, um, but I think it deserves to be asked, because it is actually so obvious. Um, this, of course, is an iPhone, um, but I'm thinking of this more as just a general class of these super smartphones we have these days that have the computational power of desktops, computers, say, just 15 years ago, but they also have a lot of sensors on them. Multi-touch, um, in the case of the iPhone, you have audio pipeline, you have accelerometers, and then you have location, GPS, and you also have the constant connectivity of these devices to the network. And what all that amounts to is a very personal device, perhaps the most personal computer we've ever had at this scale. This, is, this phone, unlike my laptop, unlike my computer, is me. This is my phone number. You text this phone or you call this phone to reach me. And this is something I have with me that I can use anytime, anywhere. In fact, sometimes this is the first and the last piece of technology I interact with on a daily basis. You know, uh, the way I get out of bed these, these days is actually to read email on my iPhone. And uh, alarm doesn't really work. I read the email and then I get really freaked out about the fires I have to, you know, have to put out. And then I jump out of bed. And then before I, and before I go to sleep, if I can't fall asleep, I'll go play around the field runners on, on this. So a lot of things suddenly became possible or feasible on this platform. And so um, perhaps in a bout of insanity, I, I co-founded a startup called Smule in the summer of 2008, with my co-founder, Jeff Smith. And uh, we really wanted to explore what the possibilities of these mobile devices hold for people. Um, and so what you see here is actually the sonic lighter. 
and I'll give you a brief demo of this. And so the sonic lighter is your kind of, uh, well, when you first light it up, it's kind of your uh, run-of-the-mill iPhone lighters, of which there are quite a few out there. Um, and, you know, this response to accelerometer. <laughs> now you can run your finger through it. But that's kind of where the similarity stops. Um, for one, there's a static statement we wanted to make in that this isn't just simulating a lighter or transforming your phone into a lighter. So I don't know if you can hear this. That crackling sound is the sound of the flame burning the side of my phone. <laughs> right? And uh, here's another physical gesture. I can blow it out. Let me try that again. And this is actually done through sound. We're not done yet. Let's see. So we'll have a second sonic glider here after this one. I'm going to throw this into blowtorch mode. And I'm going to light the second lighter <laughs> with this. And uh, the last two gestures are actually completely done through sound. I'm capturing the input on the microphone. And then for the case of the phone-to-phone -phone ignition, I'm emitting a special signal out of one phone with which this phone is listening for. And there's yet another component in the sonic lighter. This is actually a feature of the sonic lighter. There's actually a globe visualization that shows you where others have recently ignited their sonic lighters around the world. This here is to provide you with a tinge of connection that, well, there's someone out there like me that have spent a dollar to buy a virtual lighter on their iPhone, and, um, and there you go. And these are the first seven-day ignitions, and uh, by the seventh day, you see that you actually the map is kind of looking like a picture of the Earth as seen from space at night. And these are points of people actually just igniting the sonic lighters. So as we were creating, I think it's this, this company, this quote keeps coming back up in the back of our heads. And this is kind of, you know, I think most of you, if not all of you know this quote, this ageless golden quote, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So we're not magicians, unlike some people here, but we do seek to make sufficiently advanced technology. And but like magicians, we want to capture that sense of magic and wonder. So um, then it, one of the next apps we did is Ocarina. And, um, and the Ocarina really is uh, meant to transform the phone to yet another physical artifact, this time a flute-like instrument. Um, let me go ahead and plug in here so I can give you a little demo. By the way, does anyone have this app? Yes. Oh, yeah. All right. Thanks. <laughs> so, all right. So this is a. Just to give you a brief demo, kind of what the design entailed: multi-touch for the fingering, um, blown to the microphone to make sound. Uh, vibrato is controlled by accelerometer, another physical gesture. So, and and then the different fingerings can play different pitches. So. So I'll give a little demo here. <laughs> Thanks. Like this. Oh, sorry. Um, and uh, that's kind of the design of the Ocarina, which was really designed to try to take advantage of as many things as we can on the iPhone. Multi-touch, <laughs> microphone, accelerometer, and also using the graphics processing unit to actually give real-time um, interactive graphical feedback. And this is actually the pitch mapping, and it actually is more than the traditional four-hold English pendant Ocarina, after which it's modeled. Uh, because it's a digital ocarina, we have perfect intonation, and we also can extend some fingerings that weren't used before to additional pitches. Um, and um, there's actually a community that's kind of built, been built around this. Um, and part of this is really kind of due to a feature of both the ocarina itself, but also what you can do with the ocarina in addition to playing it like a Flute. Let me see if I can plug in 
here. Uh, if we can go to the overhead. So I'm going to go ahead. And if you go to the globe, there's the same globe visualization. Someone called calling themselves Harmony. Is that Denmark? Let's go move forward. And this is the way you can actually capture what people are and listen to what people are playing. Justin, okay, um, and to date, um, let's go back to slides, thank you. Um, <coughs> to date, the Ocarina has been downloaded more than 1.5 million times, and people have listened to each other on, on the world list of visualizer uh, some 40 million times. And, uh, and these are some of the users of the Ocarina actually posting their videos on YouTube. Um, everyone from David Choi, who is a musician on YouTube, very well known, to people just performing for the world. Um, here's an example. Uh, if you look at what she's doing, she's uh, actually, well, she has, first of all, very good posture, and she's actually performing for us. But you can also see her eyes actually scanning something. And I, I'm going to bet that's actually her computer screen, which is probably displaying something like this. But that was Ocean and Doa, and this is the tablature for Ocarina for Amazing Grace. And this is meant to really give really anyone, with or without music training, uh, the ability to actually play their favorite melodies right out of the box within seconds. It's almost like a game. You just got to follow along and play this. So, so far, our users have generated more than 1,500 such scores on the Ocarina forum. Um, and then this also have uh, resulted in some unexpected uses. This is why I love the iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, she's uh, playing music of the night with her nose. Um, both of these are winners in our uh, $15,000 giveaway or contest that we, call, that we call This Contest Blows Ocarina Video Contest. <laughs> um, so we sent her $1,000, a Smule t-shirt, and a box of Kleenex. Um, here's another unexpected usage. Uh, this is actually picked up on a blog in September of 2008. And, and is wondering, you know, is that the mo northernmost recorded iPhone user? That's actually inside the Arctic Circle. And we looked it up on our database. There are indeed actually not one, but six different unique iPhones out there. And they were there for a couple of weeks. So we don't know what, what, what's actually out there, but they, you know, it's probably an oil, there's no actually visible landmass we could find in any map where that is coming from. So it's, it's somewhere that's large enough to actually have, you know, internet connection. If, at first we thought it might be a distress signal, but then we figured there are better ways to call for help if you got the internet. Uh, than to ignite on the sonic lighter. Um, here's another example. Zooming in into a December snapshot of the Pasadena area, you'll see a pattern emerging. <laughs> and this is one of our users here that uh, actually you can see the size of a football stadium right there and can compare that to this. Uh, the, and uh, this is actually verified in our database as one single user who walked along and, uh, well, spelled out a message for us and took a picture and sent it to us. Um, <laughs> Another instrument, the leaf trombone. And the leaf trombone is kind of another whimsical instrument designed to, well, um, both extend and also address some of the things about Ocarina that we wish we did, um, which is really to provide kind of telling people on screen what to play and also having an accompaniment while having an extended social model that we call the world stage. And uh, before I get to the world stage, we also provided kind of a bona fide kind of a composer interface online so people can 
publish content directly into the app. And so far, our users have generated more than 3,000 um, of these scores and songs for, for the Leave Trombone. As soon as they publish here, it, it's, it appears on screen. And this is the world stage. The world stage is a place where, after you play a composition, you can submit it to this place. And on this place, the app gathers panels of judges to go and judge the, the performance, giving them feedback, an emoticon, and also um, you can give them a score at the end. And these are the emoticons you can have. And not everyone speaks the same language, but this is actually a language that I think most of the world actually now speak. Um, so where will we go next? So one part of this is the Stanford <laughs> Mobile Phone Orchestra. So more five-letter acronyms, SMUEL, MOFO. Um, and uh, here we're exploring really using these devices, both in the same way as we did in the laptop orchestra, but also leveraging the mobility of the devices and the personal aspect of these devices. And we've just started. And we wear speakers uh, mounted on our hands to preserve the mobility. Those are battery powered. And we have everything that is more traditional conducted to things that are more wide area. We're exploring both of those. So to end this story, um, I think is thinking about laptops, which we've worked with, and phones. And it's kind of the relationship between them. Uh, one might say they're roughly equal. They've got the same components. It's both kind of a computer in some sense. Um, have input, output, display, but this phone has less of everything. Pixels, RAM, CPU. Um, but in some sense, this is more, because it's so personal, because it's so intimate. And so I think the conclusion we're drawing is that they're not equal. And we really deserve to kind of design them kind of almost from the inside out to figure out what the platform is actually good for and what kind of things can actually come out of that. So. And back to this question, what is this? There are two things my undergraduate computer science professor always told me were almost always good answers. One is, it depends. <laughs> and the other is, I don't know. <laughs> so <laughs> if the old computing is about what computers can do, then maybe the new computing is about what people can do. And so what we seek to do here is to find the boundaries and maybe erase them a bit, not just between geographies, but I think also between who is a performer and who is a listener, and maybe confusing that. Um, so, uh, so I'll end my talk with actually the title of my talk. Um, I was thinking of calling this Breaking Barriers with Sound. Thank you very much.